Hey, everybody, this is Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm reading the Bible through in one year. Today is day 171 of our one year Bible reading plan. I'm glad that you're with me today. We have such an awesome, powerful set of accounts that we're reading in God's word these days. I'm really enjoying it. Getting Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs. We're currently in the book of first Kings. We're in the book of Acts in the New Testament. Lots of ways that we are seeing from, from every angle that God is a God of power, that confounds the wisdom of the world. I love that about our Lord. There is nothing, there is nothing that God cannot anticipate or expect. And there's nothing that God doesn't already have a plan for that is for the benefit and the good of those who love God and who are called and walk according to his purpose. Yes and amen. That's me and that's you. We are in Christ. That's Those promises are for us. So today is day 171. And before we get into our Bible reading, make sure that you hit the thumbs up button to complete each day's reading. Even if you watch more than one in a day, go ahead and tap thumbs up underneath each video. It keeps it in your own video library so you can look back on the year and make sure you didn't miss anything. So that's an important part of it. We've got 365 videos that you're going to end up having in your library. And it also keeps that psychological formation of a habit, which is important. And you and I partner together in the gospel. Win, win, win. And uh, if you haven't subscribed already, please do so. I appreciate every subscription. It does advance the gospel online. I don't get paid to do this. I am doing this free and clear as a Christian. At the moment of this reading, my channel is not monetized or anything like that. I am doing this because I have set a commitment to spend one year of my life in God's word. And I thought as a broadcast journalist and a writer and somebody who enjoys radio and TV, I've got my master's degree in journalism. This is something I like. It's something I'm good at. And I'm happy to share it with you. I want to put it out there for other people who will one day come along. They're going to have questions and God's going to have answers through the reading of his word. So you and I partner together in that with every like, share, comment, subscription, that all adds up. Okay. There are resources linked below also from the way of the worshiper.com, including a resource to the book I wrote, the way of the worshiper, the devotional journal that goes along with it, helping you explore more of yourself as a worshiper before the Lord. These are all taken out of my own journey as a person. I'm a human being, sister in Christ, and I'm doing the same thing you do. I'm on faith the journey. This is the way of the worshiper. We walk in what I love the New Testament calls the way. We're the people of the way. All right, let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll get into the Bible. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. And thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. Lord, even as a writer, my words have no power if they don't reflect your own. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Right now with my brothers and sisters in Christ, that is our prayer. It's our desire, Lord, to honor you, to lift you up, because you said if you be lifted up, that you would draw all men unto yourself. That's our desire to help us to have kingdom eyes today, to see what we're going through, to see the way you see it, Lord, to have a perspective of eternity that you have, to not get caught up in the temporal things, Lord, the situations and circumstances of our lives, but instead they cast those burdens on you. I know that you care. I know that you hear. I know that you see. I know that you act. I know you have a righteous right arm. I know you stretch out. I know that you reach and rescue. I am a living witness to the goodness of God. Thank you, Father, for the testimonies we all carry inside of us. That's why we worship. Come and have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's get into the book of First Kings. We're in the middle of the account of Elijah. Now, remember, we had an issue. Oh, I didn't mark first king, so it's going to take me a minute. We have an issue here with King Ahab, who was the most wicked king so far. Actually, after him, a couple come that are even worse. But Ahab is up there because he sort of is a trailblazer of evil. Remember, the kingdoms are divided between Judah and a little bit of Benjamin sprinkled in there. That is from the house of David through Solomon through Rehoboam, and now there's some ancestors of Rehoboam, King Asa is in charge of Judah. Each of these leaders who came through Jeroboam, that was that was the consequence because Solomon had turned to idolatry toward the end of his life. The Lord said, I'm going to give the kingdom into the hands of a servant. And that was a disgusting thing. It was a terrible insult for a servant to rule. But God's faithfulness, he said, I would always leave someone on the throne through the house of David. And ultimately, even though the kingdoms were scattered before, right before the New Testament takes place and Jesus Christ comes on. Ultimately, 
it is Jesus Christ. He is the King of Kings and he is through the line of David. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. So God is always faithful to his word. Now here we are in the book of first Kings. And the last thing that we read was that Elijah was really struggling in his heart because Jezebel is pursuing him to seek his life. So she had wiped out a bunch of God's prophets and God came back and took out 450 of her prophets through the hand of Elijah when that fire came down. That was an awesome reading. If you haven't checked it out, go check that out. It's yesterday and the day before his readings. Fantastic. So now Elijah has, the Lord said, he said a couple things in place for the subsequent generations. One of them being, he said, you're going to give your mantle to Elisha. And that's what he's done. And now the last thing we read was that Elisha is ministering to Elijah. And now we're going to read 1 Kings 20 and 21. Now, Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, gathered his army together. 32 kings were with him, with horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and fought against it. He sent messengers into the city to Ahab, king of Israel, and said to him, Thus says Ben-Hadad, your silver and gold is mine, as are your most attractive wives and children. The king of Israel answered, My lord, O oh king, just as you have said, I and all that I own are yours. The messengers came again and said, Thus says Ben-Hadad, Although I have said that you must give me your silver and your gold, your wives and your children, instead I will send my servants tomorrow about this time. And they will search your house and the houses of your servants and whatever is precious to you, they will put in their hands and take it away. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, please notice how this man is looking for trouble for he has demanded I give him my wives and children and my silver and my gold. And I, I have not denied his request. All the elders and the people said to him, do not listen to him or consent to his demands. Therefore, he sent messengers to the king of Ben-Hadad. Tell my lord, the king, I, I will comply with the first request of your servant, but this thing I will not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. Then Ben-Hadad sent messengers to him and said, The gods do to me, and then some, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people who follow me. The king of Israel answered, Tell him. Let not he who puts on his armor boast himself as he who takes it off. When Ben-Hadad heard this message as he was drinking with the kings in the pavilions, he said to his servants, station yourselves. And they stationed themselves against the city. Then a prophet came to Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus says the Lord, have you seen this great multitude? See, I will deliver it into your hand this day, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Ahab said, by whom? And he said, thus says the Lord, by the young leaders of the provinces. And then he said, who shall order the battle? And he answered, you? Then he counted the young leaders of the provinces, and they were 232. And after them, he counted all the people, all the children of Israel, and had 7,000. Then they went out at noon, but Ben-Hadad and the 32 kings who helped him were getting drunk in the pavilions. The young leaders of the provinces went out first. Ben-Hadad and sent out scouts, and they told him, Men from Samaria have come out. And he said, If they've come out peacefully, take them alive. And if they've come out for battle, take them alive. So these young leaders of the provinces came out of the city, followed by the army. Each one killed his man, and the Arameans fled with Israel, pursuing them. But Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, escaped on a horse with the horsemen. The king of Israel went out and attacked the horses and chariots and killed a great number of Arameans. The prophet came to the king of Israel and said, Go strengthen yourself and prepare and see what you do. For next year, the king of Aram will come up against you. The servant of the king of Aram said to him, their gods are the gods of the hills. That is why they were stronger than us. But if we fight against them in the plain, we will surely be stronger than they. Do this. Dismiss the kings, each from his position, and put commanders in their places and assemble an army, like the army you lost, horse for horse, chariot for chariot. And we will fight them in the plain and will surely be stronger than they. And he listened to their advice and followed it. The next year, 
Ben-Hadad assembled the Arameans and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. The children of Israel were assembled and were all present. And they went against them, and the children of Israel camped in front of them like two little flocks of kids, while the Arameans filled the country. A man of God came and spoke to the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord. Because the Arameans have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he's not God of the valleys, I will deliver this great multitude into your hand, and you will know that I am the Lord. They camped opposite each other for seven days, and on the seventh day, the battle was joined. The children of Israel killed a hundred thousand Aramean footmen in one day, but the rest fled into the city of Aphek, where a wall fell on 27,000 of the men who were left. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city, into an inner chamber. His servants said to him, We have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Please let us put sackcloth on our loins and ropes on our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will spare your life. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, Please let me live. And he said, Is he still alive? He is my brother. Now, the men were diligently looking for a positive sign and quickly took hold of it. For they said, your brother, Ben-Hadad. Then he said, go, you bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came to him and got into the chariot. Ben-Hadad said to him, I will restore the cities which my father took from your father, and you shall make streets for yourself in Damascus as my father made in Samaria. And Ahab said, I will send you away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. Speaking in the word of the Lord, a certain man of the sons of the prophets said to his neighbor, strike me, please. But the man refused to strike him. Then he said to him, because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, as soon as you leave me, a lion will kill you. And as soon as he left, a lion found and killed him. Then he found another man and he said, strike me, please. And the man struck him so that he was wounded. So the prophet departed and waited by the road for the king and disguised himself with ashes on his face. As the king passed by, he cried out to the king and said, Your servant went out to the midst of battle, and a man turned aside and brought a man to me and said, Keep this man, and if by any means he goes missing, then your life shall be given for his life, or else you shall pay a talent of silver. As your servant was busy here and there, he disappeared. And the king of Israel said to him, So shall your judgment be. You've decided it yourself. He quickly took the ashes away from his face, and the king of Israel recognized him as one of the prophets. He said to him, Thus says the Lord, Because you have let go out of your hand a man whom I had appointed to utter destruction, you shall pay for his life with your life, and his people with your people. The king of Israel went to his house in Samaria, angry and depressed. So, I'm seeing themes here that remind me of what Saul did when he was supposed to wipe out a people and he didn't do it. And he, they said, wipe out everything, take it right down to the dust. And he didn't do it. And instead, he brought all the choicest cattle and brought them to the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, thus says the Lord, I desire obedience that is better than sacrifice. So here he goes, he made a covenant that he should not, that happened with the Gibeons when they dressed themselves in rags and they pretended like, oh, we don't have bread and we came from a really long way. And they deceived God's people into making a covenant with them. This is what Ahab did. He made a covenant. He was, God wanted to show himself again as the great king above all gods. But Ahab, has, Ahab didn't even believe it. He didn't have eyes to see it. He's having these encounters with God. God's talking to him. He doesn't want to hear it. So now he has a consequence. We all have a choice. I love seeing this through the Bible because so many people think that God is like standing over us with like a baseball bat, just like waiting to beat us down into the dust. It isn't true. For his mercy endures forever. There are consequences to every action and every choice that we have in our lives. But these are people that this isn't out of nowhere. God didn't do this. They did this to themselves. God has been very clear about who he is what he desires, what his due order looks like, what separateness looks like, holiness, cleanliness. It's not ambiguous. These people just don't care. That's a huge difference. And it's no different than it is today in the world. People just don't care. 
and they think God is so judgmental and he lacks adversity. Untrue. This is a story filled with his long suffering and his mercy that endures forever. Now we're in 1 Kings chapter 21. Now, Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard in Jezreel, right by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And after this, Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard so that I can have it for a garden of herbs, because it's near my house, and I will give you a better vineyard for it, or if you prefer, I will give you its worth in money. Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my father's. Ahab returned home angry and depressed because of the answer Naboth the Jezreelite had given him, for he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. He lay down in his bed and sulked and would not eat any bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, Why is your spirit so sad that you refuse to eat bread? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money or else. If you prefer, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel's wife said to him, are you not the governor of the kingdom of Israel? Get up and eat bread. Let your heart be happy for I will get the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite for you. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters to the elders and to the nobles that were in the city where Naboth lived. And in the letters she wrote, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth on high among the people, and set two men, sons of Belial, before him, to bear witness against him, saying, You blasphemed God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him so that he will die. The men of his city, the elders and the nobles who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them, as it was written in the letters that she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. Two men, children of Belial, came in and sat in front of him. And the men of Belial witnessed against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth blasphemed God and the king. Then they carried him out of the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. When Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, she said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to sell to you for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. This is the second time that we have read about what a coward Ahab is. Back in our reading, in when we started in chapter 20, the Lord is saying, I'm going to deliver the enemy into your hand and you're going to know that I'm the Lord. And Ahab is like, who's going to do that? And the Lord's like, okay, the young leaders of the provinces. And then he says, who's going to say, go into the battle. And the Lord's like, you are. So now here we are, this big coward and now has his wife doing his dirty work for him. And you know, what's really interesting even though she was the daughter of a pagan priest and he was not supposed to even marry her at all, but he did, whatever. These are the consequences of our actions. He knew not to marry an unbeliever and someone from a pagan, but Solomon did it. He married an Egyptian woman and it drew his heart away. So anyway, so what was very interesting, Jezebel, even though she was not of God's people at all, she was a pagan Baal worshiper. She knew how to manipulate the system and that's what she did. She gamed the system. An innocent man was condemned to die by false witnesses. That's explicitly stated as a violation of God's old covenant laws that he gave to Moses. It's a violation of the law. This is what happened to Jesus. The same thing happened to Stephen, the first martyr of the church. They went and got these witnesses to say that he blasphemed God. So all that to say, this is the enemy up to his same old tricks. They still work. So she uses the she uses the law of God to bear witness against him saying, you blasphemed God and the king and then carry him out and stone him. That's what happened to Stephen. He got accused of blasphemy. And so did Jesus. A lot of interesting parallels and themes we see when we dig deeper into these accounts in the old covenant throughout the old Testament and the books of the Kings, we see, I actually see Jesus here. I see being led. Naboth was innocent. He did nothing wrong and he died because somebody else didn't like something that he had done. In fact, the Lord said, when you choose a king, he's going to take your lands. He's going to take your sons and daughters. He's going to send them out in a battle. He's going to make your daughters be his servants. He could have taken it, but he didn't. Instead, he sulked and his wife went and killed Naboth. 
this whole thing is a mess, but it shows the consequences of the laws of sin and death. People make bad choices. Why do bad things happen in the world? Because of bad people. That's why. Bad people do bad things even to good people. This is, of course, why the world needs Jesus, although that sounds like an oversimplified answer. It's not. If it wasn't for God's merciful hand on your life and on my life, it would be worse beyond imagination. As bad as it is now, we're not alone because we're never left or forsaken by the God who sees and hears. All right, let's finish up with the rest of 1 Kings chapter 21. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. He is now in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to possess it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where the dogs licked the blood of Naboth, dogs will lick your own blood. Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. See, I will bring disaster upon you and will take away your posterity, and I will cut off all your males, both free and slave, who are left in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Besha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger and and made Israel to sin. Those from Ahab's family who die in the city will be eaten by dogs, and those who die in the field will be eaten by the birds of the air. But there were none compared to Ahab who sold himself to evil deeds in the sight of the Lord, which Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. He performed the most abominable act in following idols like the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. When Ahab heard those words, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and walked meekly. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, see how Ahab humbles himself before me? Because he humbles himself before me, I will not bring the disaster during his lifetime. But during his son's lifetime, I will bring the disaster on his household. That's the end of the reading in the Old Testament. Ahab is spared because he walked meekly. He had that broken encounter with God. God's mercy doesn't just extend to the regular person who's kind of good. It extends to the worst of the worst. And God holds kings accountable. He holds church leaders accountable. He holds presidents and kings accountable when they cause others to sin. That's what's happening in our world right now in the state where I live. We are one of the most sinful states in the United States of America, especially regarding the destruction of the unborn. We have the worst abortion laws in the United States where I live in the state of New York. And my tax dollars pay for that. And I believe that this is the word of the Lord, that it causes me to sin. And I know because I trust the Lord that he will hold those people accountable. But I also know that if they humble themselves and walk meekly before the Lord, he's a God of another chance. God is a God of mercy. And if he gives it to me and I didn't deserve it and they don't deserve it, he'd still give it to them. Thank God that he is a God whose mercy endures forever. Okay. Yes and amen. Let's go over into the New Testament. Reading today, Acts chapter 13 through verse uh, verses 1 through 15. When we left off yesterday, I was supposed to stop at verse 23, but I didn't. I read verse 24 and 25 to finish out the chapter of Acts chapter 12. So today I'm going to read Acts chapter 13, 1 through 15, and we'll be all caught up. When we last left off, we were reading about the death of Herod. He had a bunch of like worms spill out of his guts and stuff because he had just killed James. He had um, James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. And people are afraid and it pleased the Jewish leaders that that was done because they had they hated what was going on with the spreading of the gospel of Christ. It's getting worse. Everybody's believing thousands of people and they're running with the message of God through the the Holy Spirit is coming with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And Herod becomes very upset and he decides that they're going to, he wants his ego stroke, stroked and everybody is yelling um, when he's talking, he's giving a public speech and they're saying, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him. Not because God is not without mercy, because this is a man who is reaping the consequences of the things that he has sown. He has sown dark things and the Bible says here he was eaten by worms and died. 
I don't know if the angel of the Lord struck him in that moment and the worms were there, or if he was riddled with syphilis or something. And finally it came to a point in time where the worms literally ate him and he dropped dead. Doesn't matter to me, whatever God wants to do when people are outside of his promises and outside of his presence and outside of all the things that come with serving the Lord, he is a willfully disobedient, just like the king of Egypt was the Pharaoh. This is where we are. Okay, so the last thing that we read was that when Paul and Barnabas, uh, Saul, he's still Saul at this point, when Saul and Barnabas had fulfilled their ministry, they came back from Jerusalem because remember there was a famine and they had brought relief, such a beautiful image of the way the body of Christ takes care of each other, bringing relief to people that were suffering. So they departed and brought gifts from the local churches in Antioch and they brought it out into Jerusalem where people were suffering. And now they're back and they picked up with them now, John, John, Mark, John, whose surname is Mark. And we're picking up in Acts chapter 13, verse one. In the church that was in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they worshiped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down into Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they had arrived at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues to the Jews. And they had John, John Mark, they had John as an assistant. When they had gone through the whole island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet, whose surname was Bargesus, who was with the preconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, which is his name by interpretation, opposed them, trying to divert the preconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared at him and said, You son of the devil, enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and of all fraud, will you not cease perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now look, the hand of the Lord is against you and you shall be blind not seeing the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell on him, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the preconsul saw what had happened, he believed and was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, when Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. But they departed from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia, and then they went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogues sent word to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. That's the end of our reading in the New Testament. They are preaching to the Jews. Their ministry is to the Jewish people at this point in time. That's bringing them a whole heap of trouble. I love several times here. In fact, I'm going to get out my highlighter real quick before we move on. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Saul is speaking, what he's saying here, this very incendiary words, you son of a devil, enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and of all fraud. You're perverting the right ways of the Lord. He said that filled with the Holy Spirit. And then one more time over here, as they worshiped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit spoke. That is a key. Let's just underline that. As they worshiped the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, he gave them the directions. Same thing that happened with Elijah when we read back in First Kings yesterday what, and the day before too. When he was calling down the fire from heaven, go back and listen to those ones. I won't reiterate it again, but it is a profound shift in our understanding to see why Elijah called fire down from heaven specifically. He did mention, it was because you asked me to, Lord. You've given me this plan. And so now here being sent out by the Holy Spirit and Paul filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't just shoot our own mouth. I'm a writer. I'm a speaker. I, this is the kind of thing that I do. And one of the things I've learned as a believer, as the Lord has tempered me in my older age, is that my words could never have more power 
than the words of God being filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul later writes in the epistles that I did not come to you with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. When the Holy Spirit is inspiring you to speak, even if it's hard, like it was with Elijah in front of Jezebel, in front of Ahab, in front of all the 450 prophets of Baal, who were jumping around and rolling around and cutting themselves with blood and chanting and throwing things in the air, and doing all this crazy stuff. It was hard. He was alone. And now it's hard. He's in front of a pre-consul. He's already, they've already been beaten. They've already been chained. It's hard. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power is coming and it gives power to your words. So don't fear. Like Jesus said, always pray. Do not lose heart. The, pot, the fire power of the Holy Spirit is with you. And when it's his words, nothing can stop them. All right, let's finish up with a Psalm and a proverb. Reading today, Psalm 137. We're nearing the end of the Psalms coming in a couple weeks, about a week and a half, but we're reading the Psalms through twice this year. So that'll be awesome. I wonder what God will show us the second time around. Every time I read it, I'm a different version of myself and I see something new every single time. Here we go. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the poplars for there our captors made us sing and our tormentors made us entertain saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the song of the Lord in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I do not have Jerusalem as my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, the people of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, raise it, raise it down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon who was to be destroyed, blessed is the one who rewards you as you have done to us. Blessed is the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rocks. That's the end of that reading. That is a lament over Jerusalem. The place that God chose all the way back. God chose Jerusalem and his choices stand forever. He chose Jerusalem through the hand of David when he bought the field from Ohan the Jebusite. We've already covered all of that. This is a land that belongs to God's chosen people and they are lamenting. They're being made to sing by captors and tormentors, but they are singing over a song. They are singing a song over a city that God said he loves and that his eyes watch over that land day and night. We read that in the Old Testament, in the books of the law. I can't remember which one, maybe Numbers, maybe Deuteronomy. It was a powerful thought to realize God cares. And this is an eternal choice that he made. And so this lament, I actually have one of the resources from the way of the worshiper where I did a deeper dive on being overwhelmed. And in other versions, this talks about hanging the harp in the willow tree. And here they said they hung their harps upon the poplars. It was a sign that the song had gone out of their hearts. They're depressed. They're overwhelmed. They're lamenting. Take a look at that because we walk through seasons like that where we feel captive, captive to our own choices captive to to life that squeezed us in on every side. So take a look. Let's let the Lord ignite your worship because that's the only way through this valley. That's it. The enemy wants to steal your song. God wants to write you a new one. Psalm 40 verses one through three. Yes and amen. All right, let's finish up with a proverb. Reading today, just a little nugget, Proverbs 17, 16. Why is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom? seeing he has no heart for it. Oh, that's a nice rhetorical question. That's the end. That's the end of day 171. Make sure you tap like underneath this video to complete today's reading. Check out the resources below. I am Alicia Purdy, the publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. I'm so glad that you joined me today for a reading of God's word together. Let's close together in a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. I know from my own experience, Lord, that when we lament, you do hear. You don't forget. You keep covenant and mercy forever. And I rely on that, Lord. We lean against you, Lord. We know that when things feel unstable, that you are the rock that is higher than I. Lead us to that rock, as David cried. Father, you put a new song in our mouth. Thank you, Lord, a hymn of praise to our God that many would see and would fear and trust in the Lord. When the enemy tried to steal our words, Father, you filled our mouth with every good thing. 
You are worthy of honor and praise. Father, help us today to be more like you. We need your help. Help us to speak into the darkness of our own lives and situations with the demonstration of the Spirit's power filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, to convict and provoke people and turn them to the light that is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the light of the world. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, see you tomorrow. Bye.